let's switch gears now and talk just a little bit about deserts on Earth's surface and what causes those. So glaciers form where it's cold, deserts form not where it's hot necessarily, but where it's dry. Deserts are area of low precipitation on Earth's surface. And they're driven by two major things. I won't say that that's what drives all of them, but for the most part, these areas of low precipitation are driven by global circulation patterns called Hadley cells, or they are driven by places where, because mountains force rain upward and dump out all that rain, then the air moving across those mountains is dry. On the leeward side of that mountains, we have what are called orographic rain shadows. So I'll talk about those a little bit later and we'll talk about Hadley cells in a little more detail, but I will point out just the basics of why they form. Near Earth's equator, sunlight is shining very directly there. And as a result, it heats up the air. It allows water, forces water to evaporate into that air and then forces the air to rise. As it rises, it forms these thunderclouds, which are drawn here all around the tropics. And as a result, the tropics themselves are rainy, very rainy. Lots of rain there. That's where you have big tropical rainforests. That air that has rained all of its moisture out is now dry. And it rises in this cycle called a Hadley cell to about 30 degrees north and south. At these areas, the dry air sinks. And because it's dry, you get very little rain happening around 30 degrees north and south. And so at these latitudes that cover the American Southwest, that cover the Sahara and Africa, that cover Central Australia, you end up with big deserts driven because the air there has been demoisturized. All of that moisture has been taken out of the air because it's all rained out already. And that cycle of warm moist air rising, becoming warm dry air, and then sinking and accumulating moisture as it approaches the equator. That's called a Hadley cell. The definition of deserts is usually less than 10 inches of rain every year. So it's defined by precipitation, not temperature. The largest desert, in fact, and so deserts are everything in tan here, the largest desert is Antarctica, quite cold. But we also have very large deserts in the Sahara, American Southwest, Australia, the Tibetan Plateau, and other areas that roughly coincide with 30 degrees north and south. A note on the nighttime conditions in deserts, even hot deserts have cold nights. Why is that? For a couple of reasons. One, water helps to modulate the temperature of places uh, because it's got a high heat capacity. So as heat is leaving over the course of the night, the temperature doesn't change very much because the water has a lot of heat to release at any given temperature. So in a desert where there's little water, there's little of that moderating effect. Also, because there's little water in the atmosphere, there are few clouds. And those clouds, if they exist, block outgoing radiation. So heat radiation leaving Earth's surface helps to cool it down. If you have clouds in place, it prevents some of that from leaving. And it's why overcast nights in the wintertime tend to be a little bit warmer than very clear starry nights, uh, because the clouds help hold in some of that heat. In deserts, there are very few clouds, and so they can get very cold at night. Two reasons why it is that drier places like the American Southwest tend to have much larger variations between day and nighttime temperatures. In deserts, because you don't have as much water, the main agent of weathering and erosion and transport is going to be wind. So one uh, thing that can indicate that are these grains of sand that have been rounded and frosted. The frosting comes much like glacial polish because these have been sort of sandblasted against each other. They've been weathered over and over again, polishing the surface of these grains of sand uh, and causing them to become a little frosted because of very microscopic etches and pits on their surface, scattering light. So they're no longer nearly as clear to look at. So frosted sand grains are an indication of desert sands. 
Another indication can be these rocks that sort of looked human carved, but they're actually eroded because they've been sandblasted by wind. Wind blasting on the surface of one of these vent effects uh, has created smooth polished surfaces. And over time, either the rock has rotated or the wind has shifted direction, creating a system of faceted, smooth looking stones that indicate something about the direction of wind at any given time. So at some point the wind blew that way, at some point the wind blew that way. Those are called ventifacts, rocks that look like that. Wind is an important agent of sediment transport too. So here we see uh, the Namibia, Namibian desert off of Africa blowing lots of huge clouds of sand out into the South Atlantic. So wind is a major agent of transport of sediment from deserts and within deserts. And it works not just by picking up or suspending the finest particles, but much like on um, the bed load of a, of a stream, you have many grains that either roll or bounce around or that bounce and hit other grains and then force them to bounce up into the air. Creep being grains that move right along the surface, saltation being grains that bounce into other grains and force them to bounce upward. So the finest ones are going to be in suspension, moderately sized ones can be airborne for a little while in saltation, and the largest grains move by creep. As wind moves across a surface, it tends to pick up those finest particles most easily and will leave behind larger particles like little pebbles here. And in some spots where a lot of this erosion has occurred, it leaves behind what we call desert pavement, which is just a name for pebble covered surfaces left behind because all of the fine sediments have been removed by wind. We see, these pre we see them pretty frequently in deserts. Wind also leaves lots of dunes in some deserts, picking up sand and leaving them in these features that have all sorts of different shapes, but that look somewhat similar to ripples in some cases that you might see on the bottoms of streams. So these are shaped by wind and not water. You can also see these wind ripples that look very similar to current ripples in, in different places that are sort of dunes on top of dunes, but that have been shaped by wind as well. We know that Mars has had some water on it in the past, but by and large its surface, especially in the last couple of billion years, has been much more shaped by wind. We can see evidence of that wind because we actually have these, uh, these little dust devils that move across Earth's surface that we've gotten pictures of and that have actually helped us to extend some of our Mars missions because if these dust devils hit solar panels, it clears off the dust that accumulates on them. So it's actually worked in our favor. It also, wind also has shaped a lot of dunes on the surface of Mars and we have pictures of some of these sand dunes stacked up on Mars. So wind is shaping the sedimentary deposition on planets other than Earth. Sometimes you can uh, tell what the predominant wind direction is because sediment will pile up on the downwind side where it's sort of protected by obstructions. So in this case, we've got piles of sand collecting on the downwind sides of all of these little scrubby brush uh, weeds here. And that means that wind is probably moving right to left in this image predominantly. Wind, much like water, can deposit sand dunes. And so in general, it advances by the moves of those individual grains of sand, eroding from one side and depositing on the steeper side, much like wave ripples. But these can happen on a much larger scale Despite the fact that wind can't move quite as large particles as water, they can make much larger stacked sand dunes than water generally does. Those dunes can have all sorts of different shapes. I'm not going to worry too much about why some are shaped the way that they are. Um, but one popular one that gets talked about a lot are these Barkhan dunes. 
uh, which are sort of horseshoe shaped and the tails of which point downwind. So you might see that one. And a lot of sandstones where you have, so right, have a tree here for scale, um, you know, maybe 10 feet tall. These are large deposits of rock that have very big cross beds in them, those sedimentary structures here that are reflecting the fact that these are fossilized sand dunes. You see a lot of these out in the American Southwest, not because the same desert that's there today was there when these were forming necessarily, but because at the time when these sands formed, they were in a desert. It's not really related at all to the fact that they're deserts today, but that they were deserts when they were being deposited. Another feature in dry deserts is a type of sandstone that is called arcos. So this is granite over here. And this is a somewhat similar looking, but sedimentary rock called arcos. In arcos, lack of dissolution by water, the lack of water preserves some of the less weathering resistant minerals. So quartz will stick around because quartz you know, is resistant to weathering. But when you don't have dissolution, you'll get things like potassium feldspar, and mica sticking around even more. And as a result, the feldspars don't all turn to clay and you can get sandstones with big pink rectangles of feldspar or white rectangles of other feldspars, right? Or albite. So if you were to find a rock that was arcos, that's, this would be an indicator that the ancient environment was a desert. because there wasn't enough water around to turn the feldspars into clay. Another depositional feature that you might see in deserts is called desert varnish. It's this micro, micrometer thick coating of iron and magnesium oxide minerals or mineraloids that form really in the absence of water and most easily in the absence of too much wind abrasion. So in sort of protected areas, forms this, this dark brown coating on the surfaces of uh, rocks or rock faces. And it's a popular place um, where you, you might find Native American art etched into that desert varnish because it can be scratched off. Um, and it sticks around because these deserts aren't having a lot of water to wash away this desert varnish. A depositional feature that we've mentioned a couple times in here are these alluvial fans that form in deserts that form in places where these steep valleys, you might get a flash flood that that opens out into a central much flatter valley and all of its sediment dumps out quickly into a fan shape. So we see one small alluvial fan there and then coming from another larger valley up here, we see a much larger alluvial fan extending all the way out here. These are depositional features left behind by flash flooding in steep valleys in dry areas. So this is a little unique in deserts because it's actually water forming these alluvial fans, right? It's the rare flash flood events that build up these alluvial fans. Those fans can combine into these features like we see down here. We see a lot of fans joined together into one big surface here. We call that big surface a bajada, just a name for a bunch of merged alluvial fans coming off of one ridge of mountains. Desert arroyos are ephemeral stream beds, so intermittent streams, streams that don't exist for very long except for when it floods. Uh, they rapidly fill with water after it rains. They don't infiltrate very fast. And they often look a little bit like braided rivers when they're moving along, but only temporarily. The floods that fill these can originate many miles away. And if you get rain off in the distance, you should be careful that if you're standing in a bajada, like, or excuse me, if you're standing in an arroyo like this, that it won't fill with water. You gotta watch out for that and be ready to get to higher ground if it starts to fill. Because despite the fact that it, one of these might not be particularly deep, it's moving quickly and can wash you away pretty easily. Okay, that's our lecture on glaciers and deserts. Covers a lot of ground here, a lot of different things. Um, I will see you folks online.